however you are and whenever you are welcome good souls to paranormal now this is alan b smith join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and the tantalizing turnoffs joining me tonight is Kathleen Marden. You all know her very well. She is the niece of Betty and Barney Hill and the author of Captured, co-author of Captured with Stanton Freeman. Um, Kathleen and Stanton had once been on the show together um, a few years ago, I think it was. And, uh, you know, Stanton and, and Kathleen were just a brilliant team. And the work that they put together um, not on this, just this book, but other books as well, it is a, a testament to those who do good work and are sincere in their efforts to reveal the truth about what is happening um, with alien abductions, UFO visitations, uh, ufology in general. Um, so I'm really excited to have Kathleen uh, back once again. We'll bring on Kathleen in just a moment. As a friendly reminder, call in lines are open in the last 30 minutes. So to call into the Paranormal Radio app line, that number is 1-85-KGRA-LIVE or 855-472-5483. Uh, call in, it's like linking your brain um, into the paranormal ether and we'll get your question on the air. And if you have a story to share, we'd like to hear that too because Kathleen um, is not only an expert, on the experience of her aunt and uncle, but an alien abduction experience as well. Um, and I know that some of you have had your own experiences and there's really nothing better than being able to share that experience with other people who understand where you're coming from. Um, it could just like anything else, whether it's, you know, any kind of trauma related event, you know, to be around other people who can appreciate and and believe you, because that's important. You, you know, we need that validation when we have um, very intense experiences. So if you have something to share, please call in. Kathleen is extraordinarily wise in this regard. And, uh, you know, I'd like to hear what she has to say about your experience. Um, okay, so that number again is 185-KGRA-LIVE. And uh, I'm going to bring Kathleen on and jump right to it. Kathleen, welcome to Paranormal Now. Thank you. Great to be back with you. Absolutely. So I'm going to read your bio here for everyone who is unfamiliar with who you may be. So Kathleen Martin is Betty Hill's niece, uh, and she's here to discuss details from her discussions with Betty and Barney Hill from the evidence of their UFO abduction. Uh, she also looks at the Hill's riveting hypnosis sessions in her book about their time on board the spacecraft. In addition, Friedman reviews and refutes the arguments of those who have attacked the Hill case, including the star map Betty Hill saw inside the craft. Uh, Kathleen is the co-author of Captured, and, um, well, she is the director of Mutual UFO Network's Experiencer Research Team, which is what I was just talking about. Um, and Kathleen, how has that been going, uh, working with experiencers at this point? Well, uh, it's been going very well. I set that team up. 10 years ago, and we now have 45 members, very uh, caring, professional people who mm -hmm. uh, speak with experiencers who go to the Mutual UFO Network at MUFON.com, mm -hmm. scroll down to the experiencer resource team, They've, we just changed the name of it, and uh, complete the just 30 question, simple questionnaire. Whatever you get for a score doesn't matter. Uh, it's just sort of an icebreaker. Uh, 30 points does not mean that you're an experiencer. 10 points does not mean that you're not. Um, right. okay. you know, so I want people to know that. That and the uh, the people on the team are not going to ridicule you. They're kind, non-judgmental listeners who are there to give you some emotional support, so that you can tell your story to them, and it just lifts that weight off your shoulders to do that. To to be able to tell someone uh, without the fear of ridicule. 
So, and I just stepped down from that team as the director mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago because I'm extraordinarily busy and I just didn't have time. I had to let something go. So I am now a research consultant to the team, but uh, I'm not the director any longer. Sure. Well, you're busy updating Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, uh, the book, 60th anniversary edition um, of that of that event. And for Betty and Barney, my understanding is they didn't want to share their experience with anybody, yes. really, um, because back then they didn't have support groups, right? It was it was such an aberration at the time to not only just share an experience like that to actually have an experience it was quite there were only a couple of other similar cases uh before that that were really kind of known in ufology that were reported on so you know where could they possibly go um how how did betty feel um about this e emotionally coming out of that experience did she ever think to herself maybe one day i'll share it um before the, the, the following events occurred that she ever of, of um, hypnosis and the accidental revealing of their experience. Did she ever think to herself, maybe one day I will share this, but not, not right now? Well, you know, that's a good question because uh, when they arrived home on September, the morning of September 20th, 1961 at 5.15 a.m., they sat down, they, they sketched the craft uh, each in a different room, and then they slept for a while. They took long showers first because they felt they'd been contaminated. That afternoon, uh, Betty was going to uh, call my mother, and Barney said to her, Betty, don't ever tell anyone about what happened to us. No good can ever come of it. But Betty disagreed. And she went to the phone and she called my mother. So my mother knew, the family knew. Uh, we were told confidentially. Yeah. Uh, Betty and Barney never intended to release this information to the public. They talked to the Air Force. They talked to military officers. They uh, spoke to scientists and UFO investigators. That almost sounds like too many people <laughs> as it is. And it ended up being too many people because in 1965, the story was revealed as the result of a violation of confidentiality. Okay. So uh, Barney, I think, um, he struggled more with it, it seems to me, right? It, it was more stressful, more um, anxiety-inducing. Absolutely. Uh, he, first of all, was uh, a firm believer that UFOs do not exist and that uh, it is impossible for life from any other planet to come to Earth. Mm -hmm. And so when he was observing this, he was in disbelief. He, he was having a very difficult time with that. And then he was the one who walked into the field and looked at these uh, figures dressed in shiny black uniforms who frightened him greatly when all but one uh, moved to a panel. Uh, their arms went up. When that happened, little red lights started to slide out from the craft and something started to drop down from underneath. And he was watching the face of the one who remained at the window. And Barney then feared that he was going to be captured like, quote, a bug in a net, close quote. And that's when he knew he had to tear the binoculars away from his eyes and run back to the car yeah. Um, screaming to Betty, they had to get out of there or they were going to be captured as that craft was now moving in their direction. Right. So to set it up a little bit for those who are unfamiliar with the story, um, how did this event be begin? Um, they were on a trip going up to, I think, Niagara Falls, right? They did go. Yes. They, did, they actually went. Um, and then they, when they were coming back, it was night, um, right? Yeah. When they when they first saw the the UFO. Uh, yes, they went from Ni Niagara Falls one day. They spent the night. Um, they then drove through southern uh, 
Ontario mm -hmm. and uh, stopped again for the night 112 miles west of Montreal. Then there were tourists in Montreal. And then they decided to uh, drive back home to the seacoast of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And if they grew tired, they would stop for the night. But uh, they were driving through upstate New Hampshire when this craft came in and it came closer and closer and closer. And so it, it really sparked Betty's curiosity about what it was because the flight pattern was unconventional. It was sort of zigzagging, uh, ascending and descending vertically. And uh, it, it didn't have the typical uh, lighting that our planes have. And so she asked Barney to stop, you know, and it's a long story how, how this happened. It was over a period of about an hour that mm -hmm. this craft moved in closer and closer until it finally hovered only two feet, uh, uh, 200 feet above them over the highway, forcing Barney to stop the car. Yeah. If he had driven uh, straight, he would have been directly under the craft. And so, um, He's the one who stepped out. He's the one who felt threatened. He's the one who had the conscious recall of all of that. Betty didn't. She remained in the car. So she only saw this craft. The, the light was on. The door was open. The car was running. And uh, so she finally was uh, kind of frightened for, for Barney. Yeah. You know, where is he? That fool, I'm going to go get him if he doesn't come back here. <laughs> and uh, so she was sliding across the, the seat. She knew she would have to move the car because it was directly in the center of the road. But so she uh, decided that uh, she was going to do that. But he came running to the car at that point and uh, threw the binoculars onto the seat and started speeding down the highway. And he said to Betty, roll down the window and see if you can see that craft. It was coming back in this direction. So she did. And she looked up. She was expecting to see the lights. Yeah. She didn't see lights. She didn't see the stars or the moon. She only saw blackness. And she rolled the window back up and she said to Barney, I think they're gone. Mm -hmm. And then within moments, uh, they heard a series of code-like buzzing sounds striking the trunk of their car. It caused the car to vibrate and for a tingling sensation to pass through their bodies. Right. And the next thing they knew, they were 35 miles down the highway as if only a moment had passed. They had memories of a fiery orb that appeared to be sitting on the ground, memories of a roadblock, and uh, figures standing in the road and of uh, finding themselves on a dirt road with tall trees all around. Right. And, you know, suddenly they were, were there 35 miles south with uh, just those spotty memories. And Betty turned to Barney and said, well, Barney, now do you believe in flying saucers? And he just said to Betty, don't be ridiculous. And she wondered if he was, uh, just kidding with her. And he said, I'll prove to you that I can make those sounds because there were two series of these buzzing sounds. Yeah. The one that uh, put them into some kind of altered state and the one that uh, brought them back to full consciousness. And so Barney stopped the car, and then he drove from side to side. He was trying to create that sound, but he wasn't able to. So they just drove home. Yeah. See, and the reason I've mentioned that this happened at night is because so many skeptics will use that as a way to attempt to debunk the case, right? Because so many things could be happening. Uh, it's late at night. They, they get super tired. They pull over and they just had, you know, dreams and a shared experience that they kind of melded into something that wasn't there. Or they were going over these rolling hills and there's some tower in the distance and it's the illusion as if it's a UFO, you know, these are attempts by, by debunkers. Um, they are. Uh -huh. and, right. And so, you know, from their perspective, seeing something like this uh, at night, you know, 
do we have any idea of like what that light source is when they see these beings? Is the light source, uh, not when they're in the craft, but you know, outside of the craft, uh, they see these silhouettes in the windows. Um, you know, what, what are they able to see with, with their own eyes? Well, not Betty, it was Barney who walked into that field with binoculars. Yeah, yeah. And it was Barney who saw these figures dressed in black, shiny uniforms. Right. And uh, he was so frightened that he developed what they said was a mental block, uh, amnesia for even what their faces looked like, the features on their faces. But uh, he did tell Walter Webb, who was the investigator for the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. Mm -hmm. Walter was an astronomer who worked at the Hayden Planetarium in Boston. And Barney told Walter that he was, he knew at this point that they were somehow not human. That's another quote, uh, that they were some superior beings, uh, superior to humans uh, with advanced technology. Right. So, he he sees them first before Betty. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then when did Betty first get a close up glimpse of, of them? Was that later when she was in Betty? The Betty had no memory, conscious recall no conscious memory. of okay. observing them. Um, she did have a series of five dreams. Mm -hmm. They began 10 nights after they had their experience in the White Mountains. She, uh, and she had these dreams in the morning just before she woke up. So she was in a hypnotic state. You're in a hypnotic state in the morning before you wake up. Sure. Yeah. And uh, she had conscious recall of being on that dirt road with the tall trees of fiery orb and mm -hmm. all of that. But then she had false recall. She added fantasy. Because when you have those kinds of dreams that early in the morning, mm -hmm. you're adding uh, some fantasy in order to work through anxiety that you might be experiencing. Okay. So she, in her dreams, turned those non-human entities into uh, human-looking entities who uh, had, had black hair, human features, wore blue cadet uniforms, blue cadet hats. That, that is not what they looked like. The first time that she really saw them mm -hmm. was when she and Barney found themselves on that dirt road with tall trees all around. And she remembered this through hypnosis. Yeah. And uh, she said to Dr. He Dr. Benjamin Simon, the neuropsychiatrist who had developed this uh, new technique for getting to the truth in order to help individuals who have psychogenically induced physio physiological disabilities, such as Barney had. Mm -hmm. He uh, had bleeding ulcers, high blood pressure. He'd been in the hospital. He'd had to take a three month leave of absence from work because this had such an impact on him. But um, so Dr. Simon, um, was uh, informed by Betty that uh, they're not what I thought they looked like. Yeah. And so... Uh, and Dr. Simon is the hypnotist. Yes, yes. yes. And uh, so he, uh, she comes to this realization that uh, they're not human. They, they're a little, they're kind of cute, <laughs> she says. <laughs> they're standing in the road and... Uh, it's different from her dreams because in her dreams, they were like 8 to 11 in the road. In their separate hypnosis, Dr. Simon hypnotized them separately and reinstated amnesia at the end of each session. Right. So they couldn't share information. Another reason, too, uh, at times, uh, their emotional state was so intense that if they remembered all of that at once, it could have created additional anxiety. Yeah. But, you know, so Betty sees them, uh, six of them standing in the road. Uh, she and Barney are talking and Barney says, 
I think it's them. It's the ones I saw in the field. Now Betty can see them. And she is terrified. She said she'd never been so frightened in her entire life. She opened the car door and she was going to try to run into the woods and hide, but mm -hmm. she was intercepted. And the interception, did, does she recall what that, what that felt like, what that was? They pointed something at her yeah. and it caused her to lose consciousness. Um, the next thing she knew, uh, she was uh, being escorted down a path in the woods toward what appeared to be a landed craft. Mm -hmm. And uh, she woke up then and fought them. Uh, she did not want to go on to that craft. They were yeah. reassuring her and Barney that no harm would come to them, that uh, they only needed to do a sim few simple tests and then they'd be on their way. Easy but, for them to say. Yes, Betty didn't believe them. <laughs> right. And uh, so she tore her dress fighting. She, she The hem was down on one side. Mm -hmm. The dress was torn from hem to waistline when yeah. she arrived home. And then there was the mysterious tear in the thick zipper fabric. But that happened during a different procedure. But they finally, when she fought for her life, they pointed that thing at her again. And she lost consciousness again and then regained consciousness uh, in the examining room. Right. And to put it into context for some people, Dr. Simon, he this was before the John Max, the Bud Hopkins. So the, his approach was very conservative. Um, not that Max and, and, and Bud's weren't, but his approach was this is not real. You know, they didn't have an ET experience. He was he's trying to figure out as a psychologist what you know what's going on here, what caused yeah. the trauma. Um, so what kind of controls did he use? Well, first, let me say he wasn't a psychologist. He was a neuropsychiatrist. So he was a medical doctor um, who was using a type of hypnosis he had developed during World War II when he was treating. He was a colonel in the army and he was treating um, people who were coming back from the war front with uh, psychogenically induced physiological problems, blindness mm -hmm. without uh, the uh, having their eyes injured, uh, being unable to walk with no physiological basis for that. So those were the people he was treating. And he developed a special technique where uh, he, first of all, uh, was doing kind of a um, uh, psychoanalysis Mm -hmm. Not psych just psychotherapy, but psychoanalysis in hypnosis. So hypnoanalysis of that person's life, of the experience, of uh, all of the things that were going on at that particular time in that person's life, what it made them think of. Let me give you an example of, of one of the soldiers that he was treating who was sure. blind. Uh, the other psychiatrist had worked with this soldier and uh, he did not recover. And Dr. Simon had a different technique because he went beyond the point where he saw his best friend killed in front of him. Yeah. This was beyond to what happened in the weeks prior to that. And this is when Dr. Simon found out that this soldier's uh, sweetheart had written a Dear John letter to him calling their relationship off. So it was the combination of things that contributed to this trauma, not mm -hmm. just one thing. And so Dr. Simon had a reputation for, and a fantastic reputation. He was the, the head of psychiatric associations. He uh, was in who's who in America. Mm -hmm. uh, he was at the top of his field. And this was late in his career when he saw Betty and Barney. So he's not a trained psychologist, but he's kind of operating in that area, right? Because to deal with to deal with people with trauma, you have to have some training or understanding. Well, yes, he's uh, in his residency. He specialized in psychiatry. He uh, owned a psychiatric hospital at one time. Okay. He also taught at Harvard and at Yale. 
So he wasn't so, more. He wasn't a strictly like a, a hard chemical um, psychiatrist, right? I mean, he. he no, had, he wasn't. Yeah. No. No, he was not uh, just the type of psychiatrist you have today right. who yeah. just you have a nurse or, or a psychologist working with patients and mm -hmm. the psy psychiatrist is the one who administers the, the medication, who writes the prescriptions, that sort of thing. It was different in those days. Right. I mean, could you imagine if, if the first thing he did was to subscribe him some, some chemicals and say, you know, call me in a month. Right. Uh, right. It would have been a completely different, um, uh, you know, play out of the story. And um, uh, history may have never, um, you know, uh, ex been um, what, it, what it was. And we wouldn't have had the movies and the books and the understanding. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's important because it, it really did lay the groundwork for a fundamental understanding of the abduction experiencer uh, and, and how to handle it, how to, to what mistakes not to make um, again. And also to to humanize it, I think uh, it, it went through some rough patches, and we'll talk about that. But over time, um, you know, people came to I think take this seriously, for the most part, and I, and I think that's a very very good thing. Thank goodness for that. All right, so we'll get more into this on the other side of the break. I have so many more questions uh, for Kathleen. And uh, if you've listened to this show before with Kathleen Martin on Paranormal Now, um, I promise you we'll be covering new territory. And there is new territory in Kathleen's book as well, uh, but we can't give it all away. So if you want to find out all the details about her new book, um, please go to Kathleen-Martin.com. All right, this is Alan B. Smith for Paranormal Now on KGRA Radio. I will see you on the inverted flip side. Welcome back to Paranormal Now. This is Alan B. Smith live on KGRA DB Radio. If you want to find out more about this show and other great shows like Universal Secrets on KGRA DB, go to KGRADB.com. And if you're wondering where is the music from Septembrio uh, and Lizette Xavier, well, we're putting on hold for a little bit because as we get closer to releasing the documentary in some months from now. Um, I'm just pulling back on their music because their music is going to play a major role in that uh, documentary, which is called Half Light. And uh, I'll keep you updated as we get closer. It'll probably be released around September. That's the goal um, at this point. So here we are back again with Kathleen Martin. Kathleen, I just love having you on Paranormal Now. You're just such a great presence and you really are not just a nice person, but your UFO, ufological royalty, you know, in my mind, and, you know? That's what people have said. <laughs> and it's well-deserved. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it, it's been some time um, since Stanton has passed. You yes. know, how, how have you been faring? Because for so many years you worked, you know, side by side in a sense. So um, it's been a few years now almost. And uh, was it two years now? He died in 2019. 19, yeah. So, you know, what is it like doing the research on your own now and, and, and moving forward? Uh, it's not as enjoyable, <laughs> I have to say that. Stanton and I visited um, archives, physical archives, sure. and, yeah. and did research in physical archives. And uh, so I'm, I'm happy that we were able to accomplish that together and to produce three really excellent books uh, together. Yeah. It's because um, last year uh, we didn't have any live conferences, uh, but 
after Stanton died, I was I worked alone at conferences and uh, at vendor tables, and it was just lonely, not yeah. having him there, not having his assistance. We we just had uh, a wonderful, friendly relationship, and uh, we kind of looked out for one another, and yeah. it was terrific doing that. and And now my husband is going to be traveling with me when. Okay. We can do that. You'll be at Roswell good. with me over the 4th of oh, July. Very good. Okay. Yeah. So he, he's been to Roswell a couple of times. Uh, Stanton, before he passed, was thinking about retiring. So he, my husband went to Roswell with me and, and Stanton trained him on mm -hmm. how to work at a vendor table. So, and they did that <laughs> together. And, uh, you know, so he, he really enjoyed it and he'll be there with me when he can. Yeah. But I, I really miss Stanton. I, yeah, he everyone, was a good friend. everyone does. Everyone yes. does. But, uh, I still go back and listen, you know, to his his lectures, his interviews. You know, he, he was just an amazing. He had such a big heart, and he was a very sensitive yes. man. And I don't think people yes. understood that, you know, because when he he would do interviews, he was very, you know, uh, scientific, right? And mm -hmm. he. He he would rebuke rebuttal anything that was absurd, um, you know. He, uh -huh. he, he was he was pithy like that, but 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 his heart was just he was just such a kind person. He was, um, and and we need more people like you and Stanton in the in the community, and it's absolutely true that you know no matter what you're doing, whether it's paranormal or you know I don't know soccer, you know you need those you know comrades with you. you you need those people that that will get your back and will mm -hmm. help you and encourage you and i think that's extraordinarily important and i could say that i'm very lucky that there are some people in my circle uh, particularly related to kgra that are like that um we not, may not be bffs right but we're we're friends and we take care of each other and it's really nice mm -hmm. um to have that in the paranormal community as a whole um so Let's let's talk a little bit about Barney and Betty. They they had their own stresses leading into this, right? From from a racial interracial couple standpoint. So one can make the argument that what occurred here was some sort of schism. Um, it was their way of dealing with the prejudice that they experienced. Um, I've heard that argument before. Um, David Halperin, who's been on the show, um, you know, he believes that that's possibly what happened and that it was sort of a metaphorical experience for the own, the tragedies that, and, and, and challenges that they had in their personal life. Uh, what's your take on that? And, and how do you manage that conversation? Well, what I have to say is that uh, that kind of thing, a, a psychological event, does not leave physical evidence. Mm. They had physical evidence that has been examined scientifically, and it was in the first book, and we have even more evidence now, and, and some that is just really amazing and shocking so you know when you read the book you will you'll find out what that is and so how could a psychological event uh put this very very strange kind of thing on on betty's dress <laughs> right that, and that's the dress has always been a big question in people's minds mm -hmm. right um also the the measurement of these um disc-like uh, impressions um, on the car that where, where the magnetic field was, was turning. That's another great example of hard evidence. And I think that um, we don't really get that in most cases, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but most abduction cases that are reported now, I, I can't recall of anything that was quite so, so substantial as, as what they had. Yes. Well, Tom Reed's brother, Matt, uh, had a magnetic field around the rear of his car uh, when he was taken. Oh, good point. And yeah. so uh, that has occurred. And uh, but, you know, it, Betty and Barney were 
were taken in a way that where these ETs made a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. I guess they didn't have enough experience, maybe. I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> they were set up. Uh, to, to take Betty and Barney on board. They mm -hmm. uh, had the examining rooms, they had the equipment, uh, but they made a lot of mistakes. I guess they didn't think that Betty would be so feisty. And, uh, you know, with Barney's shoes, the toes of his shoes so deeply scraped under hypnosis, he recalled that his arms were kind of outstretched as and he felt as if he must have been supported, but he couldn't feel the hands of these non-humans. And he said that he felt like he was floating and only the toes of his shoes were bumping along the rocks. Now that explains how the toes of his shoes were deeply scraped. Right. You have uh, explanations for how that evidence was, was placed there. Yeah. You know, so I can't say that it had something, uh, a psychological story, you know. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty complex story. <laughs> Interracially yeah. married couple who, by the way, were well adjusted. Yeah. Um, uh, how that could be uh, <laughs> in, conflated into this, uh, this story of, them believing they were abducted by aliens. I mean, that uh, seems pretty absurd. You don't get radar reports on with psychological abductions. Right. There were two radar reports for that night. <laughs> yeah, and the physical aspect of all this is, is quite curious. Uh, oftentimes, we'll discuss the idea that, that an ET encounter might actually be something rooted in myth and folklore the idea that an encounter with an entity could be something that's like an ultra dimensional or interdimensional or an, an elemental like a, a a fairy or something like that where it's it's not like a nuts and bolts um hardware experience um someone who's on a psychedelic uh trip might have an experience with an entity um and in this case that that can't be if there is all this physical evidence that occurred, um, you know, outside of the the physical evidence, what stands out to you the most? That let's say you aren't Kathleen Martin, you're just someone looking from the outside in. Um, that stood out to you the most. That's most compelling, evidentially. Uh, there are a number of things. That this new evidence on Betty's dress. Uh, the, the characteristics of the stars on the star map that mm -hmm. Betty observed on the craft and was told by Dr. Simon to go home and sketch it, uh, if she could remember it accurately and if it didn't bother her too badly. Well, not only did Marjorie Fish, after four years, mm -hmm. uh, find a match for that, but it was the only match. And uh, those stars had special characteristics. They uh, were all sun-like stars, although only 5% of the stars in that portion of our local galactic neighborhood are sun-like. And all of the sun-like stars in that volume of space were on Betty's map. Uh, for that to happen simply uh, by accident from a person who had not studied astronomy, who really had no interest in it, uh, is quite extraordinary. There's also something that I'm going to reveal that's new in the book. Uh, okay. Stanton had kept this quiet and in his files for years. Uh, he had written to John Luttrell who was the newspaper reporter who broke the story mm -hmm. as the result of a violation of confidentiality. Well, John had written to Betty and Barney and wanted to interview him, uh, them. He said that he had been talking with a friend of Betty's and named her in this letter. Betty and Barney refused to talk to him. So he went and he did an investigation on his own. He spoke to officers at Pease Air Force Base and he spoke to the other witnesses up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. He found 12 to 14 individuals. They were not together in a group 
in different locations who saw a craft by the same description mm -hmm. that night. And he said that he knew it was the same craft because when he drew lines from where they were to yeah. where the craft and Betty and Barney were, the lines intersected. So uh, that's big news too. Uh, John Luttrell had passed away and Stanton gave me that letter. And yeah. so I'd been sitting on it for a while and uh, that's big news. That's huge. That's huge, yeah. It reminds me a little bit of the Pascagoula event uh, with Calvin Parker. And you know, years later we find out there are these other witnesses um, that saw it with their own eyes. And and there's just nothing like that. Um, that, that sort of corroboration. Mm -hmm. It's not a psychological manifestation of some dreamlike state that, I mean, what's more paranormal, a, a UFO abduction or or Betty and Barney like melding their minds to have a dream, shared dreamlike state, right? <laughs> um, which one has more you know, corroboration? And, and so that is extraordinarily compelling. Um, when people come to you, and, and I'm assuming that they do, um, uh, you know, by email or however, even if it's not through MUFON, uh, about their own experiences, what's the first thing that you, you tell them? Well, first of all, they generally say to me, I know you're going to think I'm crazy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, I have absolutely no reason to assume that you're crazy because mm -hmm. you've had this kind of experience. And uh, so then I just, are you comfortable talking with me about your memories? And uh, so we do that. And um, then I can give them some reassurance because I have statistics. And so if they say something to me, I've, I've worked on three major studies on experiencers with mm -hmm. PhDs who were involved in, in the research as well on you know, about 5,000 uh, experiencers. Yeah. So we have some pretty good statistics. And uh, when experiencers come with, to me and they tell me something and it's heartfelt, I mean, there are grown men who weep uh, and, uh, but it's so, such a relief for yeah. people to get that off their shoulders and uh, to know that other people have had similar experiences, that other people are having whatever they tell me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so that is so helpful to individuals. And I also wrote the book extraterrestrial contact, what to do when you've been abducted yeah. for people who are trying to sort all of this out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book has uh, a worksheet at the end of each chapter so that you can go through the worksheet and answer the questions and uh, is just chock full of information on like how to document this what to look for yeah. if you're looking for scientific evidence what should you do uh what the stages you go through from denial to when you finally accept that this is indeed something that has happened yeah and i'd like to put forward that that is i think extraordinarily responsible be, of you to to have done that for people because um not unlike a let's say a crime scene or something right you want a certain amount of protocol to to so that it's not contaminated. And so by doing those worksheets in the back and, and, and reading the book, you know, that individual can kind of protect themselves, I think, from outside influence. Maybe, you know, people have ul ulterior motives um, or sensational motives that may want to take their story, twist it, turn it, um, influence them. And so by, by giving them this sort of roadmap, as it were, um, you're allowing them to sort of ground themselves in their own truth. And then whether they want to move on from there and reach out to a uh, hypnotherapist or whomsoever, I think that they've had a chance to responsibly work through um, all of that complexity, which is extraordinarily uh, important. Yes. Um, now, if someone wakes up and has a dream, right? And and in this dream, they've they've seen aliens, you know, how do they know if 
if it was just a dream or if maybe they had an experience and they, they remember it as a dream? Well, I, I have to say that that is not an indication that you have been abducted or you've had contact because okay. you can, you can dream that. But sure. most people who are having these experiences uh, have some memories that it's not just a dream, mm -hmm. it's you're awake and you uh, have the observation of a kind of light coming into your bedroom, for example. Yeah. And then there is a presence in your bedroom and you might feel uh, something walking on your bed. That's quite prevalent. That happens in about 70% of a, abduction experience it's yeah. really a lot yeah. yes uh you might see orbs in your home that seem to be intelligently controlled mm -hmm. as well uh you could set up uh like a game camera and uh, see what that captures it might shut down but it might shut down uh, for a couple of hours or maybe a little more than that uh, when it doesn't normally do that. So if you're using a game camera, yeah. you, you have to use it uh, for a, at least a couple of weeks. And uh, you have to look at your sleep patterns. If uh, you're sleeping with someone else, then their sleep patterns. And so you, you're fully aware of what is happening during the nighttime when you're sleeping. Yeah. So but, you're, you're saying that that's happened where people have tried to capture, but the camera has, has shut down. Yes, it does. And in one case, uh, it was interesting because the couple had the light coming into the room. She was sitting up looking out the window. He was sitting up take, watching the doorway. Okay. They were a military couple. And uh, then the camera shut down completely. And for two hours and 11 minutes, mm -hmm. I keep getting that two hours and 11 minutes. And then the next thing you see is that uh, he is lying down in bed now. You never saw him lying down. He was sitting on the side of the bed. Uh, it's motion activated. It should have photographed that okay. part of it. Okay. Uh, and you saw her in motion like she was being slipped in. Mm -hmm. under the sheets. Uh, and so nothing in that period of time, that two hours and 11 minutes, uh, absolutely nothing. The camera is shut down wow. completely. And uh, so it, it's not showing non-human entities, but uh, I do have some photographs of video now of non-human entities coming into the human environment. Oh my gosh. Well, and I'm going to be lecturing about that in Roswell and uh, maybe in Exeter and in okay. the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, so a, a few times this year when I speak, but it's quite extraordinary yeah. that I've been able to uh, the experiencers actually that I've worked with uh, uh, are, have been able to capture that. And you're, will you show some portions of these videos at those events? Yes, and I'll also show, I've done a frame-by-frame frame analysis. I'm okay. also going to show a frame of the, the entities. There's one that's extraordinarily interesting to me okay. where uh, there is a blue beam of light that uh, shoots horizontally across the screen. And then you see what appears to be an entity. I can see the head. I can see the upper body. And then she's invisible. She's transparent in the beam. But then you can see like a skirt and legs <laughs> coming down. And she drops off the beam and becomes solid as she descends toward the ground. And I think that she's growing larger as well. This is very it's, bizarre. It is extraordinary. So almost like she's materializing. Yes. Yes. So I'm wondering, was she an orb traveling along that beam before she started to uh, become solid? 
uh, that it appears to be an interdimensional beam. Do you know that reminds me of, if anyone in comments remembers this, it was a movie with, it was called the PAX something. Um, it was about this uh, alien possibly that traveled by light and it's, it, it, it took over Kevin Spacey's body mm -hmm. um, and Jeff Bridges was a psychologist. And Jeff Bridges just thinks it's just this man with, with some issues, with some childhood trauma. Um, but it kind of turns out not to be the case. Mm -hmm. And and that, you know, his spirit traveled. I think it was K-Pax or something like that. I can't remember the name. But it was it was fascinating. It was, it was one of those movies I really appreciated because it, it, it wasn't sensational. Mm -hmm. um, and it looked at things from a healthily skeptical, you know, side, um, which I think we need more of. Mm -hmm. um, K-Pax, thank you, Justin T. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah. So... Are there any other videos that that you think are extraordinarily fascinating in, in that regard? Um, I I have. It's not a video. It's a photograph mm -hmm. of an entity too. In another case, uh, this is the case where I don't know if you've heard of this, but uh, it was uh, Jim from uh, Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is the one who had the orb slide down his bedroom wall, fly across the room, beautiful white orb with a baby blue halo. Uh, it hovered over his body just momentarily and put out iridescent tendrils, dove into his body. Okay. He slept for 12 hours. And when he awakened, the lymphoma he had the very large nodes wrapped all around one side of his neck. He was scheduled uh, for by oncology to go in to have them removed. Yeah. And they, they were no longer visible. By the time he went in for surgery, uh, he uh, had uh, four tiny necrotic nodes removed. They were dying. They were not cancerous. And uh, that was pretty remarkable. I'm going to be showing that mm -hmm. uh, tape. And also, he was able to capture on um, film, the, the room was dark, but an, an entity that was standing in his doorway. And I tell you, I've never seen any or heard of any extraterrestrial entity that looked like this. It looked like a little elf. It was a little thing. It was wearing uh, a kind of a, a hat that yeah. round and little brim that came out. And that's what I was mentioning before, that, that, that kind of connection between folklore and modern events. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, so uh, maybe folklore is real, too. Maybe it's not the imaginations of, of humans yeah. because there is the photographic evidence. I lightened it to see if anything was there with my photo program. And lo and behold, there is this little elf standing there. That is amazing. All right. Well, we have so much more to cover when we come back on the other side of this second and last break. A reminder, in the last 30 minutes, we will open up the Paranormal Radio app line. So if you want to call in, that number is 1-85-KGRA-LIVE or 855-472-5483. This is Alan B. Smith on KGRA Radio with Kathleen Martin, and we will see you on the flip side.
You're listening to Paranormal Now, live Sundays, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time on KGRA DB Radio. To find out more about this show, you can go to paranormalnow.net or you can go to at paranormal underscore now on Twitter or on Instagram at paranormal now. Uh, Kathleen, I'm just going to read a little bit here of Betty's experience from your book. Um, Betty recalled, I have a my blue dress on and they push up the sleeve of my dress and they look at my arm here and they look at my arm. They turn my arm over and they look at it. They have a machine. I don't know what it is. They bring the machine over and they put it. I don't know what kind of machine. It's something like a microscope, only a microscope with a big lens. And they put it, uh, I don't know. I had an idea. They were taking a picture of my skin and they both look through this machine here and here and then they talk. I don't know. I couldn't understand what they were saying. And then they took something like a letter opener, only it wasn't. They scraped up my arm. They scraped and they looked like little skin. You know how your skin gets dry and flaky sometimes, like little particles of skin? They put, there was something like a little piece of cellophane plastic, something like that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this experience, this physical interaction. I know we had a question from chat. Um, I can't find it now, but it was pertaining to um, her, the injury on her arm. Yes. Uh, well, she wasn't really injured. Uh, what they did is they, they were taking samples from her skin. It was just dry, flaky skin. Mm -hmm. And I've always wondered if they were, uh, you know, we have mites on our body. Uh, microscopic mites. Sure. Yeah. And I'm wondering if they were just collecting those microscopic mites to mm -hmm. examine them. So almost like you would just take like a, like a, a sample for genetic testing or just microscopic material. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were also very interested in Betty's and Barney's uh, skeletal structure, their musculature, Mm -hmm. uh, their joints and how the human joints moved because they were different from us. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so th they looked in their eyes. Betty said that the one who looked in her eyes came very close and seemed amazed by what he saw. <laughs> and, you know, all the time that this is happening, there's a, a, the guard who was standing in the doorway. This was one of the shorter gray types and uh, frightened her terribly. So she kept her eyes closed for most of the time. She just did not like looking at him. Yeah. The other ones, the taller ones were much easier to look at. And well, she kind of liked them, I guess, except yeah. for when that needle was inserted into her navel and uh, caused her such pain. <laughs> they seemed amazed that she was experiencing pain and, and it took the pain away. Mm. Uh, but this was you know, 10 years before amniocentesis was being used in a hospital setting. Uh, I have a comment here from uh, Carol Carl. It says the arm injury was in Betty's later years. She was not very mobile at the time, as I recall. Oh, okay. So we're not talking about what happened on the craft. We're talking about uh, when Betty had cancer. Uh -huh. Yes, and, and so Betty's daughter and I took turns staying with Betty, and uh, I would go over every day regardless. Well, I, I took a couple of days off every week mm -hmm. and to help out, and um, Betty had fallen. Uh, she was insisting that she could walk without her walker. Mm -hmm. Her daughter was walking her around uh, the yard. And Betty had fallen and fractured her arm. And so uh, she was home. She, it was uh, wrapped in some something. And if there was uh, like an ace bandage wrapped around it, everything was wrapped up. Mm -hmm. And she had a sling. And I went over there in the morning. And always Betty and her daughter were dressed. The blinds were all open. The back door was open to the um, just the storm door. Mm -hmm. uh, light was flowing in all over the place. And on this particular morning, none of that happened. 
And so I w was wondering, gee, isn't it strange? They slept really late and they were still were not dressed. And then they said to me, something strange happened last night. Um, Betty was obviously not able to walk on her own. Yeah. The walker was not near her. Um, but that uh, sort of soft cast that was on Betty's arm was off and the sling was off and it was on a chair across the room. Uh -huh. uh, it would have been impossible. It was folded and put on that chair. Impossible for Betty to do. Her daughter didn't do it. And another thing that occurred is Betty had a cat, Raisa, and Raisa was always by Betty's side. And after this occurred, Raisa avoided Betty for a solid week. She was hiding under a bed. And when she had to uh, go past Betty mm -hmm. to, for her food or her litter box, she skirted the perimeter of the room looking very nervously at Betty. So uh, we kind of think that maybe something happened that night and miraculously, uh, Betty's complexion became rosy. She began to feel better. She was no longer experiencing pain. Mm. It was wonderful. We had a uh, hospice looking in and a medical doctor that we knew uh, looking in and I was also documenting her progress. And this was just fantastic. We, we hoped that she would recover fully, Yeah. but she didn't. This lasted for a couple of weeks and then her condition declined. Okay. So it's almost like um, some sort of temporary intervention occurred to in, improve her state. In that time, um, were you able to have you know different types of conversation, or did anything change between you? Or did you see that as a moment to 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 chat more? Or well, I was chatting with her all the time because I was writing, yeah. captured. I I worked on that for about fourteen or fifteen years. Okay. And so uh, I used that opportunity, all of those, a little more than a year of being there uh, almost, well, five days a week mm -hmm. uh, to uh, question her. And of course, before that, she and I, I, I assisted her a lot and I would drive her up to the White Mountains time and time again yeah. along the close encounter route. We would go to the, the abduction site and you know, so on and so forth. So uh, really asked a lot of questions in that time frame. But uh, unfortunately, uh, she did not survive, as everyone knows. This was in June when this experience occurred. So it wasn't the rally just before a person passes over. Uh, it was some kind of intervention, we all believe. Interesting. Now, since the initial in, uh, abduction, were there other potential interventions or revisits? There were some revisits uh, that Betty wrote out. Um, UFOs were <laughs> seen near her home. Her, well, your whole family. I mean, others yes. in the area saw UFOs. Yes, yeah. yes, we did. And not just the family. Uh, when Betty was doing a series of like CE5 experiments, trying to call in craft, mm -hmm. uh, working with a team of scientists, uh, there was a wave of UFOs in southern New Hampshire. And I've just recently thought, I wonder if that had anything uh, to do with what Betty was doing, trying to call in craft. Yeah. It was during that time frame that a craft landed on my grandparents' farm within 200 feet of my childhood home. I grew up across the street from them. So yeah. Betty wrote, uh, she didn't talk a lot about it. She told me, but she didn't tell the public about times when uh, she would be driving along a route and she would have uh, a friend or one of the tenants in her apartment house with her. There were all her friends <laughs> and uh, a craft would come down very close beside the car 
And on two occasions, it felt like the car had actually lifted into the air and then was put down on another track of road, um, several, a few miles down the road. So uh, there were other contact experiences for Betty, but she was criticized and, and ridiculed. Uh, just her life was made miserable. Plus there was a psychological operation going on uh, inside her home. They would enter her house and do just weird things. I think this was after Barney died, immediately after he died. I was in college and I moved in with Betty uh -huh. because of what was happening. And I saw some of this myself. Uh, and you know, they were just trying to push her over the edge. And and fortunately, who, who Betty that? was very stable. I don't know precisely who it was, if it was the CIA, mm -hmm. if it was Phil Glass and his cronies, uh, who was doing this. But uh, somebody was, the, the person that I saw, mm -hmm. that uh, I chased as he was leaving her apartment after he had entered illegally, uh, was wearing a, a brown business suit. I mean, that's not a common burglar. <laughs> no, nor is it an extraterrestrial. No, no. Uh, I don't think it was extraterrestrials who were doing that. Maybe extraterrestrials returned her jewelry really early on. Do you um, think that this might have been an early intervention by, you know, men in black? To, to use that term loosely, you know, to, to kind of scare people. Um, to not talk about their experiences? Well, I think that they were attempting to scare her, but I think that they also uh, wanted to discredit her. Uh -huh. And if she started talking about things like this, then maybe mm -hmm. she wouldn't be believed and people would think uh, Betty's going off the deep end, that gotcha. she's having a nervous breakdown or that she's paranoid. That's a favorite thing of the intelligence community is to, to say uh, that it, do this to people and then say, oh, they're just paranoid. Yeah. So, and, you know, I think that's what happened. Right. Yeah. It's like the, the boy who cried wolf. Yes. That, that same kind of a idea. Yeah. Um, so wh what about you? Have you actually ever had any experiences yourself? I mean, being so close to the family, the research. Well, when uh, Betty was working with that team of scientists and that craft landed on my grandparents' farm, um, my mother and I remembered being taken. Yeah that night and we think that was the time we were taken. Uh, Dr. James Harder, uh, who was the investigator, lead investigator for the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization okay. and a professor at uh, University of California in Berkeley, uh, investigated our case, uh, the generational abduction part of it uh -huh. and uh, he hypnotized us as well, but we were never going to go public with this. My mother never did go public and I w was going to take it to my grave, but I would uh, be working at UFO conferences and people would walk up to me who would say, you really need to tell other experiencers about your own experiences because it's yeah. going to help people. And so I thought, well, if that will help people, then I guess I will do it. And I, you know, if people want to criticize me, that's mm -hmm. fine. If they don't want to believe me, that's fine. I don't really care. Um, but, but I do want to help experiencers because I know what people go through. Did, did you have the fear that by sharing that story, your experience, it would undermine the work that you're doing, that it would discredit you? I really feared that. And, you know, Stanton knew that I was an experiencer. And, uh, but I didn't talk about it then. And I thought, I did really think about that, that perhaps it would, uh, I would lose my credibility yeah. as a researcher. And in uh, the past, um, I thought of Ray Fowler, and how he was a leading investigator during his time. Mm -hmm. But 
when he admitted that he was also an experiencer, uh, people sort of scoffed at him. And, and I thought, well, you know, maybe that will happen to me. Mm. But I think the driving force is, you know, my background in psychiatric social work. That, that's what I studied first before I did graduate work in education. Uh-huh. And uh, just the desire to be an advocate for experiencers and to assist them in any way that I could. I, I hated to see people who were interrogated as if they were criminals and who were dismissed if they didn't have physical evidence and told, well, that didn't happen because you don't have the physical evidence to prove to me that it did. Mm -hmm. Uh, Still, investigators uh, who are not familiar with the UFO uh, contact phenomena um, will not consider orbs inside a person's home Mm -hmm. as being related to contact with extraterrestrials. Uh, It does not go into reports. And I think that that is unscientific. You have, if you're really going to understand what is occurring, you have to examine everything. You can't dismiss part of it and put it on a shelf. Yeah. You you know, you have to really look at all of it. But don't you think that's changing now or? I think that it is beginning to change. And uh, several years ago, I decided that I was going to very gently uh, bring this part of it in, in my lectures at conferences. So I uh, did some photo work. Uh, My husband took a photograph of me sitting in a chair and then I took a photograph of a tree and I inserted the photograph of just me like sitting on a limb. And so I I called it out going out on a limb. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I talked about uh, the the interdimensional part yeah. of this, and I showed the evidence, the photographic evidence. Yeah. So uh, just to open people's minds very gently, I I didn't want to get kicked out of the conference, but I I wanted yeah. to very gently expose uh, the audience and other researchers to. Uh, the investigation to to the knowledge that I had from doing all of this work that I've done in this field for 30 plus years. Well, for for you, it must be because you're an experiencer. So it must be validating to to hear other people as well. Right. Um, And so I think there's a hypocrisy with UFO researchers, not so much now, but certainly in the seventies and eighties and even nineties where you couldn't share that kind of experience. And, and yet they were critical of the scientific community for not being Mm -hmm. open-minded. And, and I, I do think that the things are changing quite a bit. Uh, Ryan Sprague has mentioned, you know, multiple times that when he first was writing his book, he was kind of afraid to share his experience, um, you know, which was an eyewitness event. And, um, and that was only like 2016, 2015, when he was really going down that path. So, but since then, I, the past few years, and maybe it has a lot to do with the coverage of ATIP. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe even it hasn't just affected the popular culture, but the, the UFO culture as well. Maybe people are feeling a little bit more um, empowered to share their stories, because at least some aspect of ufology is kind of legitimate, uh, legitimized at this point. Yes. Uh, for, what was your experience? It, it could, how much did you remember afterwards? I remembered quite a lot. I remembered being on a table and uh, that there were entities around me that were terrifying to look at. But it, it, I mean, it really did traumatize me. Mm-hmm. I I changed into a different kid when when that happened, yeah. and uh, so it was something that I investigated for years. I I looked at. I tried to dismiss it as a dream, but my mother remembered it too, and uh, there were two witnesses to the craft that night. 
uh, coming down for a landing. And so uh, I've, for years, I, I had other experiences where people saw the craft. And in one of those, people were actually looking for me and couldn't find me, probably because I was on that craft. Um, you know, so finally, you know, I'm trying to dismiss it. I'm trying to say, well, it's uh, maybe I'm fantasy prone or maybe I'm just having a dream. Yeah. But when you have witnesses to the craft and you're missing, uh, it's, it's really hard to dismiss that. And I had conscious recall, too, of, of the entities. Uh, I did have an ab reaction finally. Uh, where I remembered what they looked like with a huge release mm -hmm. of emotion uh, pent up inside of me. And they, they were the ones that Betty and Barney interacted with. Yeah. And, it, and sometimes it could be a trigger, right? Something will just kind of flood memories back. Uh, yes, yes. And it was talking out loud about this mm -hmm. step by step by step what was happening when all of a sudden it was just like I went nuts so, uh, with that powerful emotion of they're not human. Yeah. They're not human. Yeah. And so, you know, that was a really difficult. But after that, it felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Right. It was really healing. And then the first time that I went to a support group, and I spoke with the group. I was weeping. And, uh, but it, another weight lifted off yeah. my shoulders. But what, what was that? What, what is that weight? I mean, what does that mean? Does that just mean that you had um, emotions that you didn't process? And, or what, what was that? It was uh, tension in the body, almost shaking when you're talking about it. Yeah. And then suddenly there's, it's all gone. That release of emotion yeah. is gone and you feel relaxed and you feel whole again. And you have people who will listen and, and believe what you're saying. Mm -hmm. They can identify with it because you, I might say something and, and someone in the group said, I've never heard of that before, but that happened to me. You know, right. it was, it's that kind of thing. And, and so that was very helpful. And that's when I developed the idea of the experiencer research team yeah. at, at MUFON to uh, provide some assistance to experiencers. Right. I, yeah. And I'm glad that you did because, you know, like I've said, that that trauma is very real. Um, for me, I had an experience when we had a babysitter that um, many of the kids went to and, you know, the babysitter would hit kids with a belt and mostly in the butt, right? Because you can kind of hide it. Um, and it was a very, we loved going to the babysitter because we loved the mother, but it was her husband that was doing this. And, um, you know, I, I never shared that because I was afraid. And, and so it wasn't until years later um, when this person, uh, he was arrested uh, for molestation. And then fortunately I didn't have that experience. Um, all of a sudden it was like, boom, all that experience that I kind of suppressed when I was a kid just came flood. The memories came flooding back. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was, it, it was a kind of like, oh my God, you know? Um, and then it wasn't until many years later when I, I really started to process that, um, and, and was able to talk about that in, in that kind of a group therapy situation. And, and that was extraordinarily healing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and that's, so you are doing a service, you know, I, I guess I'm just trying to make that really clear that mm -hmm. it's a good service uh, that you're doing. Um, I have a, a question for you from a, a private chat, and that is how, why do aliens choose who to be a, a duck? I'm sorry, who to abduct? Is it a random choice by ETs or a chosen human to study? Well, I have done a lot of research on uh, communication. Uh, between the ETs 
and experiencers, what is given to them. And uh, what they have indicated is that initially uh, it was random. But when they found a, a human that had the characteristics that they were looking for, mm -hmm. then they started taking uh, the family of that individual. And what we discovered in our research is that experiencers uh, have increased spirituality, very high level mm -hmm. of that. Uh, they're psychic or uh, intuitive. Uh, they become empathic so they can like, feel another person's pain, for example. An empath cannot harm another person because wow. you suffer that pain. I think if the EDHs are doing that to us, they're brilliant uh, to do that. Mm. And, you know, so there are special characteristics that experiencers share. Yeah. And they're very similar to the characteristics that near-death experiencers share. Well, of course, our concept of an, someone being empathetic or an empath is based on our human experience, right? So uh, even if these are similar to us, these extraterrestrials biologically, um, I mean, I mean, science, at least some studies have, have shown that it actually might be quite universal for beings to be humanoid like um to have uh you know the uh, binocular vision mm -hmm. um to be able to duck down low duck you know go up high which should uh, a a hominid can do a bipedal hominid uh so th there, there are many things that might be similar but maybe their brains and their idea of emotion isn't isn't the same um so what their idea of being empathetic might not exactly be our idea of being empathetic. Uh, do you They're think they're different? Yeah. Um, and, and my experience has been with the ones that are called grays, but they're, they're more human, like they're more Asian only with grayer skin, larger eyes, that kind of thing. And, uh, they, uh, in, one incredible thing that they did was to kind of throw the love, emotion of love toward me. The most intense experience with love that I have ever had. Oh my God. Nothing like on this planet. It was just so loving. And they weren't saying it. They weren't hugging me. They weren't doing anything. It was just projecting that toward me. And, uh, you know, I lost my fear of them when they did that. And some people say, oh, well, they were being deceptive. They don't really feel that way. They're just doing that. But whatever it is, uh, they, I had that experience and lost my fear. And once I lost my fear, I was be able to begin communication with them. And they gave me some information. Okay, so from that perspective, your perspective, um, how do you have conversations with people who have had traumatic or very negative um, experiences? Well, as far as I'm concerned, everyone is entitled to their own experience. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I, mine was negative until I, I overcame that. But uh, my perception was colored by fear. fear. The fear factor was the big thing. So I thought I was being exploited. I thought I was being mistreated. I was absolutely terrified and carried that trauma in my body. But uh, then it stopped. I mean, there are other people I know who are treated very badly. I'm not certain if uh, they are actual extraterrestrials who are doing these hor horrific things to humans mm -hmm. or if they're just negative interdimensionals uh, but i've i've heard some horrific stories and uh, i do know that some people develop attachments right. with negative interdimensionals right
Okay, so we're going to open up the phone lines. If you want to call in and ask Kathleen Martin your questions, the Paranormal Radio app line is 1-855-472-5483 or 1-85-KGRA-LIVE. Call into the Paranormal Radio app and our producer, Bill Skywatcher, will pull you on, wait for your cue and ask away. And and if you do have your own uh, experience, I'd like to hear from you and and your take on on all of this. So I want to go back, Kathleen, uh, quickly to the Marjorie Fisher map. Um, So for for some, maybe one way to explain it, and, and let me know if this makes sense to you, is we did this when we were kids. We had tracing paper, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then you would draw little dots to, to go over maybe a certain points of a map. And we can do measurements and, and write on it. And I, and I wonder, is it is it kind of like that? So can you take the Marjorie Fisher map the, the from Betty, right? That the sheet, the vision she had, and put that on on like tracing paper, mark the stars, and kind of put it over top of a star map. Is it like that? Boy, that that's a difficult question. It's, Betty, it's three Betty, dimensional, right? Betty saw this map in uh, volume uh, of three dimensional, right? Yeah. And then Dr. Simon gave her the suggestion to draw it uh, on a piece of paper with a pencil, and uh, Betty's reason overtook the suggestion, and she erased one line and she drew it in another spot. Okay. In the end, uh, that was the one line that was a little bit off. Uh, interesting. And for everyone listening, Marjorie Fisher, she was a men, men, member of Menza. She was a very smart individual. She was. Marjorie Fish. Oh, Fish. And, uh, yes. She, she uh, studied biology in college. She was teaching mm-hmm. school single and amateur astronomer when she was doing this. And after she did all of this research, she was hired to work at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So she was a a technician there or an assist research assistant. Right. All right. So we're going to take our first call, Ron from Minnesota. You're on the line with Kathleen Martin. Welcome, Ron. Hi, how are you doing, Alan? Good. Hello to Kathleen. And Happy Mother's Day to you and everyone thank else. You. <laughs> thank and, you. And um, I wanted to say also thank you for your work that you do and you have been doing. And of course, I got to, uh, I, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting with you and chatting with you on my own station, which I thought was really amazing. And uh, I, I think you've gotten a little bit farther than when we had our talk. So, I want to thank you for all your work that you're doing. And the question that I had for you is this. You, you've done a lot of regression therapy sessions now. In all of these sessions, do you see any uh, similarities within the um, the case, the different cases? Or another, is there any kind of a, a point-to-point references in in these cases that you're investigating? Well, certain procedures have taken place for over a number of years with with the individuals who are taken periodically. So we know, you know, with, as we knew back when Bud Hopkins was uh, beginning his investigations that, that ova and sperm are being taken um, that uh, there are implants that are, are inserted. Uh, there is education that takes place on the craft. Uh, s- different entities seem to have uh, kind of different procedures. For example, for the implants that the grays have, uh, they tend to be very, very tiny. But uh, with people I'm finding who have had interaction with the uh, mantis type, it appears that they have larger. I just spoke with a man who uh, has uh, 
what might be an implant in his arm that he can actually move around. It's about the size of maybe a penny or a nickel. It's a coin. And then Terry Lovelace, uh, who has written a couple of books now, he was a lawyer and now he's retired. And he had a very large uh, implant, uh, one in each leg. Uh, and he interacted with these uh, mantis type entities. So uh, there are different things that are occurring. I have recently worked with uh, the people who were actually able to capture these uh, non-humans on uh, video. And there were two groups working together. I'm not positive if it was mantis types and a reptilian type and humans or not. I'm still trying to figure out, you know, looking at their physical characteristics on, on the film. But uh, the, the one who interacted with the human types received, uh, she was not placed on a table. She did not undergo any kind of physiological procedure. Uh, she was told that uh, they had known her through all lifetimes, that they had once lived on this planet uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, that there was an environmental collapse, and that they uh, had the means, uh, the technology to travel into space, that uh, not many people got off, but they did. And they found another planet in a binary star system and had settled there. And that they come back from time to time just to check up on us. They claimed that they don't take anything. We believe that some of the entities might be mining uh, rare earth materials. And so there are different things that are occurring. And, and some people are very nice and... Uh, the entities that they are interacting with are very nice and, and give them knowledge, whereas other people are not treated as nicely. That's why I try to encourage people to just try projecting love, <laughs> even if it's really, really hard to do. <laughs> when, when you're in the presence, try to pr overcome any fear, any hatred, anything. Um, project love. And if you project love, a negative entity is going to leave if it's a negative interdimensional. They're looking for your fear. They're feeding and growing off fear. Um, but uh, so just try to project love and, and uh, any kind of non-human entity that appears to be of extraterrestrial origin will have a, a kinder response to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for, again, thank you for all the work you do and you. keep up You're the welcome. good work. Hopefully I get to see you, uh, uh, maybe not this year, but maybe next year at some of the conferences. I know uh -huh. we're going to start opening up here pretty soon, and I, I just hope that I get to see you at one of the live ones. All well, right. I hope that we can meet again. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you all so right. much, Ron. Thank you, Alan. Great show. Okay. Have a good night. And uh, knowing Ron, I know Ron puts love out there. So that's, that's, um, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with you, uh, Kathleen. And uh, I was kind of discussing this uh, a week ago about, you know, not necessarily being afraid of negative entities because um, you kind of just need to get yourself in a state of mind. Um, and I think that's it. That's the state of mind, right? Of, yes. of love. Um, I mean, all you need is love. You know, John Lennon, the Beatles said it a long time ago. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. It's just, it's getting there. That's the difficult part. But once you can get there, it's, it's fantastic. Um, all right. We have another caller on the line. We have Anna from Canada. You're on the line with Kathleen Martin. Welcome. Welcome. Hey, Welcome. Anna. Minute here. How are you this evening? Very good. How are you? I'm not bad, thanks. Not bad at all. Yes, I've had few, quite a few experiences of abduction, I believe, uh -huh. starting from the age of four and a half, I think, was my first one that I remember. Mm -hmm. Although it didn't register at that age, it registered as a white dish rag coming through the hole in the wall. And it didn't come into perspective until 
oh, geez, about eight years ago, I was in KGRA chat room, and they had a guest talking about abductions. And they mentioned this alien coming through in a white doctor's coat. Mm. And I thought, wow, was I describing that being as a white dish rag because of my age? What do you think, Kathleen? Well, there's, there is a possibility of that, you know, the coming through the hole in the wall. Uh, a lot of these entities will uh, do something, particularly when they're uh, taking children. And I have to say that the vast majority of, of people, of experiencers, were taken for the first time when they were under 20 years old. And close to 40% believe they were taken when they were five years older or younger. And um, so children will see them as like giant bunnies or clowns or uh, firefighters or uh, law enforcement, kind, you know, law enforcement people. And they do this so that uh, children will feel more comfortable with them. So, you know, maybe the, the dish rag uh, could have been the, the doctor's coat coming in. Yes, and that's what kind of went, whoa, in my head. And then when I was about nine, I noticed a line just at the top of my leg in my thigh area. Mm -hmm. Now, I've never been to the hospital except for being born. Never had any operations of any kind. But I made a point of telling everybody throughout my life about this line and showing them my line. And telling them I don't know where it came from. I've never had any operations of any kind. And then in my 20s, I woke up with a scoop. Ah. In my, in my, the bend of my arm. And of course, I put that down when I found it to an old needle from the doctors. Like a vaccine or I something have, like that? Yeah, yeah, or give, taking blood or whatever. Okay. But in the back of my mind, it kept saying, doctors don't stick needles in the fold of your arm. Correct. And I mean, right? my, my experiences with needles is I've never had a mark left over from that. Now, that might be different. Um, during different procedures, but I've, I've never experienced that. And no. many experiencers uh, have scoop marks taken from the backs of their arms and around the joints for some reason. Uh, also yeah, on the knees, the backs of the knees. And uh, I've got one in either arm in the exact same spot. Mm -hmm. The line, like I said, I've had as long as I can remember. And the line never, I don't know, it never phased anything. It was just there, but it was something that I needed to mention and never forget, but I didn't know why, mm -hmm. why I needed to mention it and why I was not allowed to forget it until, shit, pardon me, about eight years ago, same KGRA room, mm -hmm. um, I had been watching a video on YouTube of a Mexican woman that had been abducted. Mm -hmm. And didn't she have the same line as I do on the inside of my thigh? Only hers was on her wrist. Well, I fell over on my chair. Yeah. Well, I can't and imagine. I thought, all right, there's, there's, there's no more denying. You cannot deny anymore. And that's what we were talking about tonight, Kathleen, right? That, that yes. you hear a story and it can trigger a memory. Mm-hmm. There's no no denying. I've got so many. I woke up in my bed about five years ago, about three or four in the morning, and I've never been a runner. I've got bad feet, so I've never ran. You know what I mean? Even as a kid, I was never a runner. But yet, I flew out of my bed, and the wall right beside my bed is three feet away. Mm -hmm. So it's only two steps. And I flew out of my bed at a thousand miles an hour, hit that wall, smashed back onto the bed, 
looked around. My heart wasn't racing. My hands weren't shaking. There was no fear. No, nothing. It was totally blank. Nothing. You know, and, and I have to tell you that Denise Stoner had the same experience. Uh, Denise is my co-author on the Alien Abduction Files and an experiencer that I wrote about. I had investigated her case. Uh, I didn't know her well at the time, but we became friends. But uh, Denise had the same experience. She's being returned, apparently, uh, or taken, but something went wrong, and her head hit that wall in her bedroom so hard that she ended up having to have physical therapy. And she had uh, some really large black and blue marks on her body as well, where there was some kind of accident there. Um, maybe she was supposed to be going through that wall and there was a malfunction. I don't know, but I know that other people have been injured uh, when something didn't open that should have opened. Well, I think I was running from something. Mm -hmm. But I don't have any memory of anything because there was no heart palpitations, no fear, mm -hmm. nothing. I was just totally blank. Did those feelings uh, feel natural to you, that, that lack of fear? No, 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 no. I knew something was, was totally not right, totally off. And why was I running? Because I don't run. I can't run. I physically cannot run, but I was running and I hit that wall a thousand miles an hour and bounced back on the bed. Well, I mean, it sounds that in, in a sense you were lucky based on what Kathleen was just sharing. And we had, there are so many stories about people going through walls. Um, was this a one-time experience or did, did a similar experience? Oh, um, I woke up one morning and I defy anybody to try this and test it. I have a queen size bed with king size sheets. I do hospital corners like the army. Mm -hmm. So they're very tight and snug. And when you have king size sheets on a queen size bed, that gives you three feet almost of tuck in at the bottom of your bed. Okay. I went to bed, had a nice hot bath, climbed into bed. I woke up in the morning. I was in the middle of the bed with my head sticking out of the bottom of the bed and everything around me was neat. The hospital corners were still tucked in nice and tight on both sides of me. The bed was totally neat, completely around me. There's no way I could have got my head out the bottom of that bed. No way in hell without messing it. Sure. Mm. But there I was. Thank you. Anna, do you have uh, one more question uh, before we go? Nope. That's, well, I can tell many stories, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what that experience that you had is also common. I've heard that time and time again from experiencers. Being yeah. upside down in the bed and head down at the foot of the bed. Yes, especially with everything neat around you. Yes. That's making yes. logical sense. Mm -hmm. The Anna, bed has been destroyed. Yep. Thank you so much for, for calling in. I really appreciate it. Um, and Kathleen, right. is <laughs> you too. Thank you. And Kathleen, is there um, somewhere that Anna can go to as a resource um, right now to maybe link up with other experiencers? Uh, she, the MUFON's Experiencer Resource Team okay. uh, has a list of online support groups. So the way, if, if she would like to join one of these support groups, mm -hmm. she should go to MUFON.com, complete the questionnaire, and uh, then a person on the team will contact her and she should say, I heard Kathleen on the radio and she talked about the online support groups and I would like to join one of those so that I can talk with other experiencers. And uh, so there are several and, and she'll be able to receive a referral. That's great. And, and join a support group. 
Kathleen, have you heard of a movie from 2017? And uh, this is a, a message from a friend of mine, and it's called Darkening Sky. Yes. And, Bryce well, Zabel? Was that Bryce who did that? I, I don't know. I, I haven't seen it. Um, but I guess they were wondering, you know, did you have anything to do with that film? No. Okay. Because ap apparently there was some accreditation um, to Linda Moulton Howe, Stanton Frieden, and Kathleen Martin in the film. Oh, well, maybe there was something then, and <laughs> I just don't remember it. Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. A lot of, I give a lot of people information. Uh, so. be before we, we started the show, we were talking about some paranormal type films, right? Uh, is there any one film out there that, that you particularly like that you feel represents, if not factually, um, but at least the, the ethos of, of the experiencer or both? There was one that, what was it called? Um, I can't, I, I just can't remember the name of it. I, I've been in a lot of different documentaries, mm -hmm. um, but uh, there was one, I did have it listed on my website for a while um, for experiencers and, and what experiencers go through. And I thought that they did a very good job on that. Uh, um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the representation in Spielberg's movie of these gray aliens are friendly like, and you described uh, one of Betty's descriptions as being kind of friendly-ish. Uh, do yes. you think he drew from that, that description? That they drew from Betty's? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I was told that they did. Uh -huh. What are the name of that film? It's called Beyond the Spectrum. Oh, Beyond the Spectrum. Okay. Yes. All right. So I'll have to look for that. Um, so uh, if you can leave us with, with something about their experience that you think is important for not just aficionados to know, but but for the, the public to know, um, what would it be? It would be the primary message, I think, that, ex that these ETs have been telling experiencers dating back to 1954, that uh, they are here to assist in our development that uh, they are very concerned about our use of nuclear weapons because it could cause an environmental collapse. It could lead to uh, what they said was the disintegration of our species and not just us, all life on this planet. And so they are here, they're attempting to upgrade us uh, so that we will be less primitive and uh, we'll be able to uh, sustain ourselves on this beautiful planet that we live on. And so uh, many different types have given that, that one message. I think it's important. And upgrade us, does that mean like physically the brain or what? Uh, it has a lot to do with emotions. It has to do with the ability to communicate telepathically. Um, so, you know, as Stanton used to say, they want to quarantine us. That's why they're here. But they don't. <laughs> Maybe they have been quarantining us, but they we're going out into space. And they would like to upgrade us so that uh, we are different than these primitive warlike people that we are now. How does that affect free will? Uh, you also, you will have free will. They're not going to take away your free will. Okay. This is uh, just uh, like they, they make people empathic. I, there's nothing wrong with that. But what they if I don't want to be empathic? <laughs> <laughs> Me, I don't but. know. Well, I've <laughs> never asked that question, and no one has ever <laughs> told, asked that question as far as I know. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I mean, there are people out there who might be like, I don't care what you think, consider an upgrade. I like the human race just as it as it is. Um, but that's really not our, our story, is it? I mean, I, I always feel like 
evolving is is part of our story. Um, I think that it is. Yeah. Evolving is very important. Yeah. All right, Kathleen, thank you so much for joining uh, us tonight. My pleasure. I really appreciate it. And if you want to find out more about Kathleen, go to Kathleen-Martin.com. And uh, please check out the new book, uh, Captured 60th Anniversary. And there are some surprises in there that I think you will all appreciate. Thanks again, Kathleen. This is Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now on KGRA Radio, live Sundays, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. KGRDB.com is your official contact for the best in alternative talk radio. And coming up in just a moment after this show is Tracy Austin with a fourth generation experiencer. So in a sense, we can continue this story on her show. Special thanks to KGRA producer and head of operations, Eric Brager and my producer, Bill Skywatcher. Until next time, everyone, live in the misery.